in the last couple of years across the nation and in our state capital, unfortunately. We welcome you to our center and thank you for attending today's very important uh, debate. We feel the office of the Attorney General plays a major role in upholding the laws of our great state. Again, thank you for attending. We'd like to invite uh, Naveed to uh, read out the rules for this debate. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Mashur. Uh, once again, welcome to today's uh, debate. Uh, we hope that this is uh, thought-provoking and, and we also hope that this will lead to some of the uh, some of the changes that need to be that need to take place in criminal reform uh, uh, activities or uh, initiatives that are going on across the state. So today's debate, we will begin with uh, an opening statement uh, from each of the candidates. Uh, they'll have three minutes uh, to uh, to give their opening statement. After that, the question and answer session will start. Uh, on my right-hand right side, as most of you already know, are the candidates. On my left-hand side are the panelists. Um, when the time for question and answer from panels and audience comes in, uh, I would request to limit your answers to about a minute and a half, about 90 seconds. Um, so, in terms of our uh, candidates, today we have Ms. Kathy Jennings, uh, Chris Johnson, Patricia Roberts, and Kim Mullaney. In terms of our panelists today, we have Premi Ejaz Saber, we have Michelle Al-Samah, uh, he is a PhD, uh, he's a doctoral candidate uh, in law. We have Kathleen McGay, she is uh, uh, the executive director of ACLU Delaware. And we have Christina Jedra. She is the investigative reporter for News Channel. Uh, we will be uh, streaming this debate live. So if you uh, would like to share it, please feel free to go to uh, uh, Delaware Council for Global and Muslim Affairs website and uh, you'll have that link uh, to share if you like. Uh, and with that, we, I will invite uh, Shahid Bajwa to give us an opening invocation uh, with the verses uh, from the Quran. And after him, uh, we'll, we'll go uh, in this sequence from Kathy to Tim, uh, three minutes each for the opening statement. this important debate tonight. My name is Kathy Jennings. Can all of you hear me? Yeah. Okay. My name is Kathy Jennings, 
and I am running for Attorney General because I want Delaware to be a safer place for all of us to live, to work, and most importantly, to raise our children. I want a justice system that is fair and equal to everyone, regardless of race, religion, the size of your wallet, or the zip code where you live. I want to give a helping hand to people on the path to recovery and not a prison cell. I want to see Delaware and the justice system become a place where freedom is valued over incarceration, where compassion and understanding takes the place of indifference and ignorance, and where mercy has a higher place in our law than vengeance. I was born in the city of Wilmington to a single mother. My father left before I was born and we didn't have two dimes to rub together. My mother was treated as less than because she had been left by her husband. But she went on to become the first college graduate in our family. When I graduated from law school, I joined the Department of Justice to make sure that people who were treated differently, who were victimized, had a voice. And so I was the second woman in the criminal division of the Attorney General's office ever to serve in that role. I protected victims of domestic violence by trying their cases. I protected children who were abused by trying their cases. And I protected rape victims by trying their cases. I went on to try homicides, including Delaware's only serial killer who murdered five women before I prosecuted him. Then Attorney General Charlie Overly promoted me to be the second in command of the entire Attorney General's office. I was the first Chief Deputy Attorney General who was female ever to serve. And I formed the first Consumer Protection Unit in the state of Delaware. Charlie and I went on to private practice where I defended the rights of accused people and I represented teachers in securing their employment rights. Then Attorney General Bo Biden asked me to come back and run his criminal division. When I came back, we started the hard work of criminal justice reform. I hope tonight that I can gain your support for Attorney General because I have the experience and the know-how to continue that hard work of reform so that Delaware is a safer and a fairer place for all of us to live. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm running to be Delaware's next Attorney General. Um, I'm running to be Attorney General uh, to end mass incarceration. Um, there are too many brothers and sisters who are in prison um, in Delaware. Um, in fact, Delaware has the 11th highest incarceration rate in the country. Um, we have over 71% recidivism rate. Um, and we have uh, devastated communities, destabilized communities up and down this state. And so that is why I'm running. And when, as I've been on the campaign trail, I've seen um, just not only are our communities impacted by mass incarceration, but we have issues with justice, um, environmental justice, income inequality, educational inequality, so many other systems that are plaguing our neighborhoods that there is no justice. And so that is why I'm running. So for me, it's personal. I've been dedicated to community service and giving back my whole entire life. I grew up in a union household. Um, my mother was the secretary of AFSCME. My father was in the Fraternal Order of Police. Um, so I grew up with dedication to service, and that was always number one. Um, I attended the University of Delaware, um, where I was in, in, in the business school, but also a track athlete. So it was always working hard on the field and off the field in the classroom. So I've been driven to always give back. And I continue my studies in law school to change the laws, to change the system, to really make change like civil rights pioneers in the past have done. And so I dedicated my career to public service. Um, after a stint in private practice, I entered public service for the city of Wilmington, where I worked with the mayor's office and city council firsthand 
to address the ravages of gun violence that plague our biggest city in Delaware. Um, and we work on firearms legislation, body, con body camera programs, and a whole host of initiatives to make sure our communities are whole again. So we must address this issue because it is of utmost pertinence to each and every one of us. In mass incarceration, whether you have a loved one who's, in, who's inside or not, it would affect you. Um, we have too many homes without fathers and mothers because we have treated prison as the first answer, and that is not the answer. So I implore Delaware to um, invest in people, not prisons. And that's what we must do. And the old saying goes, you know, no justice, no peace. That's this chant you hear. And that's true. But I also believe in the opposite. Without peace, there cannot be justice. And we must have peace in our neighborhoods, in our homes, in our families. And mass incarceration is what tears our families apart. So I look forward to speaking with everyone tonight. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lucretia Roberts, and I'm running for Attorney General as a Democratic candidate. It's my pleasure to be here with you tonight. I spent eight years of my career at the Delaware Department of Justice. I've been an attorney for about 10 years. During my time at the Delaware Department of Justice, I've seen the successes and the failures of the system. I started out as an entry-level deputy. I was sworn in by Attorney General Bo Biden. And during that time, I worked in the family division. And that's where I really got a, a keen perspective on the challenges that people in the state of Delaware are experiencing. I worked in the child support unit. I worked in the juvenile, juvenile delinquency unit. I represented the Division of Family Services in actions to bring youth in foster care. And I also prosecuted domestic violence cases. Uh, I spent my career during that time really focusing on youth and families. After spending about six years in the family division as a deputy, Attorney General Matt Den appointed me to be the director of the family division. And then one year later, he promoted me once again to be the chief deputy attorney general. I was the first African-American woman to assume that position of the Delaware Department of Justice, where I, I oversaw the work of all five divisions and I managed 225 attorneys. In January of this year, I left my job to run for attorney general because I see this as an opportunity. I see this as an opportunity for us to really think about the role of the attorney general and the attorney general's approach to public safety. During my experience at the, the Department of Justice, what I saw is missed opportunities. I think we need to do two things. We need to hold the next attorney general accountable for changing the way that we're doing our jobs at the Department of Justice. First and foremost, the Attorney General needs to work on prevention, and I believe that begins with kids. We need to make sure that at-risk youth are receiving services so that they stay out of the system. What bothered me most as a prosecutor is to see young people funneled into the juvenile justice system to only become adults in the adult criminal justice system. Second opportunity that we have is to work on recidivism through helping returning citizens. The Department of Corrections at this point, quite frankly, is not rehabilitating prisoners. And they're being returned to the community with absolutely nothing, no resources. So of course we have high recidivism rates, right? So what we need to do at the Department of Justice is be, become a partner because quite frankly, what has happened in the state of Delaware is the nonprofit community has stepped up to fulfill a need and support returning citizens and help them just do the basics, identify housing, find jobs, commit, commit the uh, requirements, the terms of their probation so that they can actually remain stable in the community. But the Department of Justice has an obligation to be a partner in those efforts and advocate for funding to support those efforts. So what I'm asking you to do today is support me as a candidate for Attorney General because now is a time for change. Experience is important, but vision is absolutely necessary. We need to leave the past behind us because what was done in the past is what's gotten us here today with a broken criminal justice system. So let's work on reform, and I ask that we have an we take advantage of this opportunity to do it together. So I ask for your support on Thursday, September 6th in the Democratic primary. Thank you. My name is Tim Mullaney, and if you haven't figured out already, I am a candidate for Attorney General from the Democratic side. Um, I think it's important for for the citizens to know who the people are that are running for office. So I want to go into a little bit of my background. Um, 
first I'm married, I have six kids, a new family, and 13 grandkids. We just celebrated the youngest one's first year birthday yesterday. So I've got a large family that's um, had a lot of diverse history <laughs> in and of itself. Um, I'm a Vietnam veteran. When I came back out of the military, I went to the Dover Police Department, served 20 years there, retired, spent two years as a uh, instructor at Polytech uh, High School. Uh, and at that point, I was appointed as United States Marshal for the District of Delaware by then President Clinton. I served eight years at that post, and then I spent two years as County Attorney for Newcastle County under Tom Gordon's first administration. Um, and then just recently, uh, I served as his Chief Administrative Officer in the last uh, administration for Tom, his last year. But most importantly, I spent eight years with the Department of Justice uh, under the Attorney General Bo Biden. He brought me in to fix the problems that were in the criminal, in the uh, consumer protection unit specifically. I spent two years as the director, uh, where we went from being listening in on phone calls for multi-state investigations to leading those phone calls. We became one of the premier states um, in dealing with the, the uh, mortgage-backed securities fraud issue as well as other you know, consumer fraud issues. I then spent two years as the director of the fraud division overseeing all the units within the fraud division, investor protection, Medicaid, and, and consumer. Uh, the last four years, approximately, I spent as chief of staff uh, to then Attorney General Bo Biden dealing with a myriad of uh, issues. Uh, the reason why I went into my background is because I think the problems and the serious problems we have facing the criminal justice community now uh, is one, that we need to have everybody rowing in the same direction. We need to have everybody on board. It can't just be the Attorney General by himself or the Department of Justice by themselves. We need to have everybody um, realizing that there's a problem and how can we address, address that problem. I think my credibility and experience across the board um, lends itself to being able to form uh, a cohesive effort towards changing the, the various issues that we have in the criminal justice system. Um, but I'd also like to point out that while the criminal justice part of our job, our duties, is, is vast and very important and they have some very serious problems, we also have some other areas that we need to, that we have responsibility for. And we, we've got to make sure that we're paying attention to that as well because they affect the, the way the citizens go about their everyday life, whether it's uh, consumer fraud, construction fraud, uh, exploitation of seniors and so forth, uh, or landlord tenant issues as well as manufactured housing issues. We have to make sure that we're paying attention to those aspects of the criminal justice program as well. Uh, I look forward to discussing some of the issues in the criminal justice field uh, in the questions I'm sure we're going to get tonight. So thank you very much. candidates, distinguished panelists, uh, audience, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I welcome you uh, on behalf of the society, and it's a great evening. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you very much for coming today, and it's going to be a wonderful evening, and very informative evening. Uh, my first question is, if you are elected, keeping current political environment and divisive environment in mind, what would be your office policy regarding criminal justice reform, especially regarding minorities and disproportionate incarceration of minorities? This question has two parts. Um, the second part of the question is, what will you promise to do within your first 100 days in office to show your commitment to criminal justice reform? So I guess we'll go in the same order. Or you want, let's start from that side, Tim, if you don't mind. No, not at all. Um, do you want to repeat the question? Uh, no, I think I said the question. Um, I just looking down to make sure I've, I've, I've got it. Um, I, I think first off, the first 100 days, what we've got to do is make sure that um, that the deputies that are handling the criminal cases are are made aware of the fact that it's it's not in getting conviction 
but to make sure that we're seeking justice, because that's what the Department of Justice is about, is, is to uh, make sure that justice is, is served. And what, what we need to do is make sure that people that are similarly situated for the same crimes, whether they have a Gene Maurer representing them or someone uh, from the uh, Public Defender's Office, um, that they're treated the same way regardless of the socioeconomic status, that if they've committed a burglary and they're and their life sentences should their sentences should be the same, and we have to make sure that we tell our prosecutors that that this is what we're going to be doing. This is how we have to deal with this issue, um, because that's the only way you're going to be able to show uh, that people going forward that everybody, no matter whether it's race, um, gender, or uh, socioeconomic status, that they're going to be treated the same way uh, as someone that may be better in a better position financially to to uh, and take care of that problem. I, I think that that's what we have to do. We have to look at the the the, the end. We have to look at the way they enter the system and not at the end of the system. Because New Jersey, through 2006, 2016, reduced the prison population by 20 percent, but the racial disparity in the prison didn't change. So you're not really dealing with the issue. You you reduced prison population, but you haven't attacked the source. And what we need to do is look at uh, racial impact studies on our laws when they're first uh, proposed so that we can see you might have a, a law that looks on its face that it doesn't affect um, anyone disparately, but you have to sit there and look and say, okay, what's the effect of this law? And you have to look at it hard and see if it doesn't have a disparate effect upon the minority community. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to answer both questions in one response because I think that when we're talking about uh, policies related to reforming the criminal justice system and dealing with um, disproportionate representation of minorities in the criminal justice system, that has to be the next attorney general's priority within the first 100 days. So I think that there are two areas in which we can address this very effectively. Um, oftentimes, um, during this campaign cycle, the conversation that we're having really surrounds, all right, we need to change the laws to really affect the disproportionate impact on minority communities. But we have to take that one step further. Changing the law isn't enough. We have to change the culture of prosecution. We have to change the way that prosecutors are exercising their discretion when they're handling cases. And I think that begins with implicit bias training. We have to take advantage of the opportunity to make sure that prosecutors are educated on implicit biases and aware of their own biases. That's just the basic, that's the foundation. And then we can take it one step further from there. We have to change the way that we're evaluating performance. Um, prosecutors, you know, because of the culture of the past, there's just this default of measuring success of the success of a case based on the number of years that someone gets in the Department of Corrections. Instead of looking at best outcome for all individuals involved, whether we're talking about a defendant, a victim, or the public as a whole. So we need to really change the way that we're measuring success at the Department of Justice and making sure that prosecutors are aware that they're going to be held accountable in the way that they're exercising their discretion. Next, I think the data will be critical. We're going to have to start collecting data on how we're handling cases at the Delaware Department of Justice. I would like to collect data beginning at arrest all the way through the disposition of the case and collect data regarding who that defendant is. What is their race, racial and ethnic background? What is their socioeconomic status? So that we can really measure how prosecutors are doing their job. That information should be transparent. I think that transparency is important so that the Department of Justice can be held accountable in its obligation to ex execute the, the law fairly and the data can be used to inform management at the Delaware Department of Justice with regard to how they need to change policies or implement policies or measure the success of prosecutors in the evaluation process. Thank you. So the question was to how to, uh, to, to change the dynamic in face of the political onslaught that we're facing today. And I can say from personal experience um, that it starts with ending structural racism. Um, this is something that's personal to me. Um, this is something I have dedicated my career to. Um, this is not just a campaign talking point. Um, as a longtime board member of Delaware Center for Justice, 
and also a, a leader in the coalition to dismantle the new Jim Crow, I have fought with the community to fight against this system. And so for me, it is personal, um, as well as my professional goal, that this must end. And it starts with how we treat each other as humans. And we have a system that's set up that, that oppresses black and brown people. And so we must look at getting rid of the government policies that do this. So in the criminal justice side, it does start with just um, you know um, changing the policy and practices that hurt folks who aren't wealthy. Um, right now, it, it, again, as you may have heard earlier, um, the, the, the type of wallet you have and how big your wallet has determines what type of justice you get. And we can't have a system that works that way. So we need to decriminalize poverty. And so that's through ending cash bail. That's through um, you know, working on increasing funding for legal defense. That's through a whole host of measures that simply deal with injecting fairness into the system. And so on that same side, also to, to really combat structural racism, it is a training issue. Um, there's simply, um, it's a training and a recruitment issue because you can't, unfortunately with all biases, you can't out-train it. And actually the latest evidence-based studies show that bias is inherent. But what you can do is increase diversity. You can increase exposure to different communities. You can increase police interaction with um, communities. You can increase prosecutor interaction with communities. That stuff we can do tangibly from day one. So it starts with civic engagement. It starts with rewriting the laws and policies to be fair and truly colorblind. It also just goes to encouraging justice reforms all around. Like I said in my opening, uh, we need fairness in terms of income inequality. We need fairness in terms of affordable housing and health care. And all these, as Attorney General, I will fight and advocate with the governor and with stakeholders, with the city of Wilmington, with the city of Newark, with all the government bodies to make sure that there's fairness and it's sure that our citizens are taken care of so they cannot engage in criminal activity. In my first 100 days, it's really going to be an Attorney General just getting my hands dirty and assessing the talent there, figuring out where the holes are, figuring out exactly where we need to reallocate our resources. Because right now, too many resources are spent on low-level crimes. We need to refocus resources on um, the violent crimes and also the consumer protection side of the office. So that's going to be the first 100 days, honestly. It's not going to be flashy, but it will really bear fruit later on. And then after that comes the training with national experts and really just changing the culture of prosecution, as some have said, and also the culture of how we treat each other as human beings. We all agree that criminal justice reform is critical. And you've also asked what we would do in the first 100 days, what the Attorney General would do. In order to assess what we will do, what the Attorney General will do, I think it's important for you to look at what has been done. This is not theoretical to me. This is very real and practical. When Bo Biden asked me to come back and run the criminal division of the Attorney General's office, I began the hard work of criminal justice reform. Let me tell you about a man I represented when I was in private practice. And throughout most of those years, I did it for free. This man, when he was age 16, was the lookout in an armed robbery. His older cousins brought him down from New York. He had no real criminal record. He came down to be the lookout. His cousins went inside a shop and they stole, but they also shot and killed the shop owner. The 16-year-old boy was tried as an adult and he was given multiple life sentences. When I met him in prison to represent him, Lawrence had spent more than half of his life in jail. I worked to change the law that made that possible. I worked actually with Senator Brian Townsend, your senator, to change that so that juveniles would not be given life without parole when it was unjust to do so. I also work to change the three strikes and you're, you get a life sentence law successfully because people convicted of three drug offenses should not be receiving life in prison. I advocated for that on the floor of the legislature and I was successful in that effort. 
The criminal justice system needs massive reform. We need, as some have said, to end the cash bail system because you should not be in prison because you are poor while you are waiting for trial. That is unjust. We need to stop the unjust stacking of minimum mandatory sentences so that it becomes a numbers of years in prison, assembly line of justice, and not individualized justice. I worked to increase the number of cases that did not have to be subject to that unjust law. And as Attorney General, I will continue that effort. We need more and better treatment if someone is incarcerated. 90% of people come out of jail, but they don't come out of jail any different. And so that has to change. Finally, I would work to make sure that the culture inside the office reflected that mission and the mission is justice the mission is not to incarcerate someone if we can do so safely thank you um with all due respect um, i request honorable candidates to try to limit your answer within 90 seconds if you can because we have quite a few questions to go we just finished on the first one thank you with that quickly thank you kenny um, Attorney Matt General, uh, Matt, Attorney General Matt Den, rather, created an Office of Civil Rights and Public Trust on his second day in office. Um, and one of its jobs is to enforce laws around corruption and abuse of public funds. How well do you think this office has performed in terms of holding public officials accountable? And what changes, if, en if any, would you make to that office? Um, if we can start with you, Thank you for that question. It's it's. I commend Attorney General Matt Dan for opening the Office of Civil Rights and Public Trust. It is woefully under-resourced. It's under-resourced at the very same time that our hard-fought civil rights and constitutional rights are under attack. And so it is incumbent upon the Attorney General to make sure the necessary resources are within that office to protect our civil rights and to fight public corruption. And so I would strengthen that office. When I was Chief Administrative Officer for Newcastle County Government under County Executive Matt Meyer, one of the first things we did was to create a sanctuary policy for Newcastle County residents so that people would use our services without fear they would report crime without being asked about their immigration status and police, the Newcastle County Police Department would not participate in ICE raids. As Attorney General, I will seek to have that become a statewide policy because we must protect people in this very trying time from people who would foment the politics of hate and replace them with understanding and with peace. I really, you know, I don't have too much of a feeling about the office besides um, probably what mirrors most of um, you all here is just question marks um, because there haven't been any police found to have um, committed misconduct. There haven't been any uh, wrongfully convicted individuals um, that have been um, freed. So there's been nothing right, that has occurred. So uh, I, I guess it, it you know, is, some, is really an office that has to just simply get to the core of what the problems are in the community. And the problem is, uh, again, lack of resources, lack of direction, but more importantly, I believe it's kind of conflating a lot of issues. Um, I believe we need a a separate you know, office that deals with innocence, um, those who are wrongfully convicted, those who are entrenched and ensnared in the system. I believe that's one office. But we also need a vibrant civil affairs office that deals with the day-to-day -day, um, complaints and discrimination that we all face. Um, that's, a group, that's something I've heard from many community groups. Um, that's something that NAACP, I know, promotes. And that's something I believe we need to get back to, having a separate office. The state has a Human Relations Commission, but um, that's, again, an under-resourced, underutilized 
um, office. So I believe we need a truly a civil rights division, a civil rights office that works on simply the day-to-day -day discrimination that we may even face um, and many members of your community face every day. Um, whether it's at the pool or the library or in the schoolyard, there's discrimination that doesn't rise to the level of the criminal offense, but it still needs to be addressed. So I believe a separate broken off office needs to be formed, um, aside from the Office of Civil Rights and Public Trust. Since I announced my candidacy, I've had um, many conversations with individuals in the communities and who have expressed quite a bit of concern about their interactions with the police and quite a bit of concern about their what they're reading in the newspaper about misconduct uh, of public officials. And they've made their expectations quite clear that they expect to see follow through with the next attorney general. Uh, with regard to the reports of police misconduct, what I found most concerning is that uh, there was a fear related to you know, making a complaint to a police agency to know that that agency itself was going to, to conduct its own internal investigation, um, which makes me keenly aware that we need to change that process. I think that the Department of Justice, as an independent office, the Office of Civil Rights and Public Trust, needs to be there on the front end, conducting its own independent investigation and determining whether or not um, there is any misconduct and whether or not charges are appropriate. Uh, one thing that I can say is that as the most recent Chief Deputy Attorney General under AG Matt Den, from my observation, the purpose of the Office of Civil Rights and Public Trust is good. But what we need to see is more in-depth, independent investigation. We need to educate the public to make sure that they're aware of the services of that office and they feel comfortable independently making referrals to that office and be prepared to investigate and prosecute. But my final point is the most important point. You have to elect an AG that isn't afraid to actually prosecute a case. You have to elect an AG that's not beholden to anyone in the state of Delaware. We live in a very small community. So to the extent that we're putting a candidate in that office that you know, is connected to Delaware's establishment and has a tough time following through on the promise to do justice and hold everyone accountable, there's an issue there. So you need to be paying attention. You need to be electing an attorney general who actually will follow through and is fearless in conducting the work of that office. You asked whether or not the Civil Rights and Public Trust um, Division that was established, how is that working? Um, first off, you have to look at where it came from. Special Investigations, it was a unit within the Department of Justice that handled just about all the things that are encompassed within the uh, the civil rights and public trust issue. What they did is they took a fraction of the personnel, split it off, and made it a division, which was woefully un underfunded and understaffed from the get-go. It was just uh, the amount of complaints that come in to the Department of Justice would stagger one. Uh, uh, we get a lot of calls in regards to those type of issues or just questions. Um, so it does, it's not staff. It doesn't have the, the, the personnel that's, that's capable of doing it. So it's kind of doomed from failure. The only additional part that they were given with the Project Innocence um, was the additional um, duty that they were given to, to oversee. And to date, I don't think anybody has applied or there hasn't been any uh, action whatsoever on that one area. Now, I don't know what the, the problem is because that's, you know, they're not going to publicize that kind of information, but it just seems from the results that it's, it's not working. And we have to do more to either bolster that and, and give it an honest shot or, or just let go to the wayside. I think we need to bolster it and give it an honest shot. Thank you. Okay. Um, question number three. Delaware law allows for the suspension of driver's license for failure to uh, pay court debt or failure to appear in court. Um, this disproportionately impacts low-income people. 
many people who do who do not pay don't pay because they cannot afford to um, and they are penalized by not being able to drive to get to a job to pick up their kids from school or accomplish other basic daily tasks um, without facing potential further charges having to come up with $50 to get your license reinstated or $500 if you are caught driving on a suspended license just perpetuates the problem. Um, would you support the elimination of driver's license suspensions for failure to pay, failure to appear, and non-driving related offenses? Um, Lucretia, could we start with you please? Definitely. Yes, I guess I certainly would. Uh, support uh, doing away with the suspension of driver's license. As I mentioned um, earlier, as a young deputy, I started out in the child support unit, and the suspension of driver's license was regularly uh, a product of the process um, in that a failure to pay child support would result in suspension of a driver's license, but it, it doesn't make sense, right? If you need to work to support your children, you need your driver's license so that you can then get to work. So, you know, I think this is just a step in the right direction and it's just common sense solutions that make um, certain issues particularly challenging for individuals who don't have the funds uh, to pay a fine and need to, to comply with, you know, court obligations and child support. I totally uh, agree with Lucretia. I think what we have to do is uh, look for other ways to deal with those type of issues. But the bottom line is uh, a driver's license is a lifeblood for an individual uh, for taking care of his family, whether it's to take people to doctor's appointments, uh, shopping. It, it's those, that, those things, it's a thing that you need to, to be able to function. And to take it away when you're already at the lowest point, I think it serves no purpose. It actually exacerbates the problem. a very good question and I fully support not taking away someone's driver's license under those circumstances in fact the law used to require your driver's license to be taken away when you were convicted of a drug crime even though that drug crime had nothing to do with your ability to drive and so I successfully fought that law in the legislature and did away with it so that now you don't lose your driving privileges because what was happening is people convicted of minor drug crimes would lose their job because they couldn't get to work and so the problem just gets worse and worse same situation here it makes no sense i would take it a step further i think arrest warrants for failure to pay a fine when someone can't pay that fine is nonsense it's it's really bad, it's pernicious, and it disproportionately affects people of color, it disproportionately affects poor people. I have represented people who have been locked up for failure to, to pay a fine that they're never going to be able to pay. That just needs to end. And uh, my answer is in line with everyone else's that uh, you know, simply suspending driver's license is not a, a, an answer. Um, but I do take it a step further, and, and I want to talk about the, the criminalization of poverty, which is drives my campaign, it drives why I'm doing this, because it is these systems that have been set up for decades that have existed. And those in power have done nothing. And that is why I'm taking a stand to say enough is enough. Because you all have probably sat here 10 years ago and heard the same thing. But we have this system that exists. So, you know, we need to elect leaders that have not been a part of this system. Um, as we heard Ms. Roberts say earlier, you have to elect leaders who are willing to go against the grain, willing to rest their careers. And I'm that type of leader. Because this is really a debtor's prison, modern day debtor's prison. And it is too much, and we should all be sick of it. And those who are enforcing it right now, we need to vote them out. Question number four. As a reporter and someone who files a lot of uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, 
and concerned about Delawareans access to public records. The Attorney General often issues the deciding opinion on whether the state must provide documents to the public, information on everything from public safety to how tax dollars are spent. Um, what specifically would you do as Attorney General to ensure and perhaps increase Delawareans' access to public records? Mr. Maloney, can we start with you? Sure. I think first off, what we have to recognize is some of the timelines that we have in the existing law um, are just timelines. They, they're never adhered to. Um, they're always being weighed. Um, so we need to fix that and either uh, make timelines that are realistic, because some of them aren't realistic, um, make them realistic and, and have some type of um, ish, uh, some type of uh, penalty, uh, for the lack of a better word, uh, consequence, so that if you're not doing it, it moves on to the next level, as if that person may have won. Um, because right now, you never know when you're going to get an answer on a FOIA request. You put it into this one end of a maze, and sometimes it'll come out, sometimes not. You may be, you know, a year or two before you even get to the end where you can go to court to, to enforce it. So we have to do something more realistic. The other thing is the Attorney General's office needs to staff itself to deal with FOIA because currently it's not staffed you know, properly to be able to deal with it in an effective and a timely fashion. Um, and then the bottom line is we also have to look at the lawyers, laws themselves to make them a little bit clearer, a little bit more clear cut, and a little bit uh, easier so that the everyday citizen can look at it and says, if I ask for X, I know that I can get it because the law says I can get it. And right now we, we see in the papers too many battles in, in regards to um, you may get a document, but it's three quarters of it or three fifths of it that is redacted. So we need to work on that because I think that it's supposed to be construed in the matter best to the public when in fact I think the act exact opposite is what's occurring. I believe the greatest opportunity lies in really working on the FOIA statute itself. Uh, a lot of the confusion that I've observed as Chief Deputy stems from the exemptions and interpretations of what they mean and, you know, public entity withholding information and then you have that disagreement with the, the person who's requesting it, the entity taking another position, and then the Department of Justice having to make sense of a statute that's unclear to begin with. Then you have the added layer of the unreasonable timeline. You know, the, the whole appeals process within the Department of Justice was supposed to be a means to help the community because the reality is a lot of people don't have the resources to file in court to, you know, actually have this dispute with the state agency who's with, withholding public information. So we need to make sure that the timelines are realistic. Right now, look, there needs to be, it needs to be quick because access is important, but at the t same time, if it's going to oftentimes be a, a means, uh, a, a process instead of a court process, everyone needs sufficient time to be heard. Um, whether that's the petitioning person, the responding state agency, and then the, the Department of Justice needs time to review the information and really provide a thorough opinion so that everyone can appreciate why the outcome is what it is. And finally, I think the third opportunity is consistency in opinion so that the department can, the public, can have an expectation of where the department will fall on certain issues. And, uh, you know, I certainly agree uh, with everyone else that there, there needs to be a change in the system. Uh, we need to let the public know what the expectations are and um, change the law so that it's reasonable guidelines and there's reasonable um, articulation of even what executive privilege is. Uh, we see right now with the Rodney bus dispute, that's a big issue. Um, but but, but I don't, before we even get into FOIA, I wanted to talk about a solution to the problem. And the solution to the problem is actually open data. Uh, we need to make uh, government more accessible to the people so that um, you, know, you don't have to search. And the state has made a lot of strides in open data. I believe the IT professionals can help us push it e even more. Uh, I believe if citizens don't have to make requests, then it's a lot better if they can just look at, see what was spent on government, 
Um, there's open checkbooks. You can look at procurement. The public can just see it without having to make a request. And that's the most efficient and the fairest way. Um, so I would really move to in support of state and the initiatives for open data. And many states even digitize their FOIA. Um, other states, when you go to the FOIA request, you can actually see previous requests made. Um, states like Iowa have that. And so I believe we need that kind of technology here. Um, and when I was serving in the governor's office, I was the FOIA coordinator. And I can tell you the current technology the state has is really outdated. And in a lot of departments, people still use Sharpies. So we must use technology and 21st century innovation to make government work for the people. I believe strongly that government works best when the sun shines upon it. And FOIA is the primary means by which many people obtain information about how our government is working. But unfortunately, FOIA itself is not working very well. And so more resources need to be devoted to answering citizens' questions about how our government works. What we see instead are more redactions than substantive information on a document that is handed over to the public. That's not right. If that means that the laws need to be changed, we should change the laws. If it means more resources, and it does, uh, to be devoted to this important aspect of government, then we need to devote more resources to it. When I worked with County Executive Matt Meyer, one of the first things we set up was open checkbook on a website so that you could, for the first time ever in Newcastle County, see how your taxpayer dollars are being spent. I would encourage state agencies and I would make sure that the Attorney General's office posted as much information as possible on our website so that we were as transparent as possible. Open data is important because it makes government work. Thank you. Looks like much this time. Um, we are halfway through the fifth question, but unfortunately, time wise, we're not halfway through. Mm -hmm. So, again, um, like reminder, please keep uh, uh, track of time with the honor system before we start raising flags. So, uh, my question is to Mr. Johnson. Uh, although you are all are running for state position, but we have seen attorney generals uh, lately jumping into national, leaping into national issues. Uh, let it be Obamacare, uh, let it be restrictive immigration enforcement in recent time. Uh, where do you see that your office sets the perimeter boundary to represent the state or it's going to fade into national issues as well? So let's start with you, Mr. Johnson. Please. As, a, as Attorney General, I will have an obligation to step up um, to protect our citizens on national issues. Um, not only are our uh, citizens under attack um, in, in terms of immigration, but our, our, our coastlines are under attack. Our environment, our air, our water, everything's under attack because of the rampant deregulation um, coming from Washington, D.C. Um, so I believe I will need to be an advocate. Right now, um, there's not too many Democratic attorneys generals throughout the nation. Um, I believe it's maybe a dozen or so. So it will be incumbent upon me to be a national leader and not just, you know, join in on the lawsuit that, you know, um, 10 other states have joined in on, but to actually be the proactive leader, um, similar to New York, similar to Massachusetts, where we're being the first to jump into litigation that really hurts our citizens. And it's nice to sign on to a lawsuit, but we really need to be the first state when it comes to protecting our citizens because we have one of the most diverse states in the country. And so our citizens are especially hurt by the draconian practices coming from D.C. Um, but yes, the, the line is, 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 is you know, it, it, there is a line. Because at, at the bottom line is, you know, um, after four years, the voters will say, did you make Delaware safer? And so my thing will be taking care of home first, you know, not being, you know, not really, you know, talking about number 45 and what's going on in D.C., but talking about our citizens first. And then also taking the action that we need to to protect our citizens in D.C. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. I actually began um, as Chief Deputy Attorney General in January 2017. So the whole process of the Attorney General's office being the front line 
uh, for to protect state citizens from what's going on in Washington really became my responsibility. So I built those relationships with other Democratic attorneys general's offices and made sure that our office was staffed in a way so that we would be able to be a partner in all of the lawsuits that you've seen the Delaware Department of Justice um, be a participant in. So I actually designated a uh, position um, to have a, an attorney staff to actually do that work. That work is, um, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot, uh, the, the work moves very quickly. Um, you have to collect uh, a lot of data from different community stakeholders, different state agencies, in order to even be a party to the lawsuit. So I understand the work that it entails. But I want to draw a distinction. You know, it's not about being the first to file. It's about being a strong partner in the process. The reality is a lot of other state AG's offices, they're the first to file because they don't have the workload that our office has. Um, in Delaware, we handle all of the criminal prosecution throughout the state. So it's, it's situated differently, it's resourced differently, but we have to make sure that we have the person, the designated person dedicated to that work and I've already done that and I'll continue to do that as Attorney General. Hold on. I think the primary responsibility of the Attorney General is to protect the citizens. And uh, protecting our quality of life um, is, is important amongst that. And the AG should be looking at regulations that allow offshore drilling that, that uh, can affect our coastline and, and our quality of life, and as well as our livelihood in, in Sussex County especially. Um, we need to be involved in multi-state investigations, um, and we need to with other states and other state attorney generals in combating some of the issues coming out of Washington. Um, that strategy is what caused some of um, the immigration policies to be challenged in the Supreme Court and to be, uh, and in federal district courts, and to be turned back. And so we have to, at every, every chance we get, whether it's teaming with other attorney generals or going it alone, we have to challenge those things that affect the citizens in our state and, and uh, our quality of life, our air and our water quality. We're, we're fighting with the EPA because they refuse to uh, to help us in regards to emissions coming out from uh, up states, uh, up uh, states that are uh, north of us that uh, their water and air come down and affect us greatly. So it's, it's important for the Attorney General to, to look at these national issues and, and attack them whenever he can. I believe strongly that the Attorney General is the one person in each state who can stand up to an administration in Washington, D.C. that is threatening our hard-fought rights. We have the right to clean water. We have the right to clean air. We have the right to health care. Our constitutional rights are under attack, and we can make no mistake about this. They are under attack. Our civil rights are under attack. It is the Attorney General who will stand up to the federal government and say no. You will not interfere with these basic rights in the state of Delaware. And so I will be proud to join forces with those Attorneys General across the country who are fighting against the rollback of our hard-fought rights. House Bill 450 was introduced during the last legislative session, and this bill would have liberalized um, the process by which somebody can get a criminal record expunged. Um, a representative of the Department of Justice testified in opposition to the bill, um, saying that the, the current system, which requires every criminal justice expungement to have a pardon from the bar, board of pardons before it can move ahead and then an approval by the governor. Um, that that was, that was the, the status quo needed to be maintained and that no pardons um, should be, no expungements should be given if a pardon was not granted. Um, so I would ask um, 
What is your position on um, liberalizing our expungement laws? And also, what is the process within the Department of Justice itself in terms of who makes the determination about what the department's position on a certain piece of legislation would be? And how could you change that process or improve that process um, if you were elected? Thank you for that question. It's a very important question that goes to the heart of one of the many things that doesn't work in our system. Um, we have laws on the books that unfairly impact people of color and unfairly impact poor people. So for example, possession of drugs within a thousand feet of a church, a school, a park. Well, if you live in the city, you're always going to be within that, that boundary. Consequently, your crime is going to be greater than someone who lives in the suburbs, who chances are aren't even going to be arrested for a drug crime. And so these injustices need to be remedied, completely remedied. And that means expungement. And that means that we need to liberalize the availability of expungement. If someone is not convicted of a crime, that should be expunged. And someone should not have to go to the expense of doing it themselves and to petition themselves. If someone is convicted of a crime and it's a minor crime and there has been a period of time, that person should have the ability to get their arrest record expunged because convictions and arrests have a long tail. They prevent people from getting jobs. They prevent people from living in a, in a housing situation. And they stay with people for the rest of their lives. That's unjust. I've worked in the Achievement Center, which is a reentry center in Northeast Wilmington. And I have seen firsthand for years the injustices of our current system. We need to broaden our expungement statutes and make it easier for people to get back on their feet and become productive citizens. My, my, my. That's whoever said that on the uh, floor. I uh, really uh, shocking, but it's really not. It was in a committee hearing. A committee hearing. Um, <laughs> And honestly, that person, um, if I'm elected Attorney General, uh, probably won't be comfortable with the new vision I'm going to take my office. Um, simply put, these are systems, um, records, and over-prosecution, over-policing, are the systems that have hurt black and brown communities for centuries. And in America, that is unfortunately what happens, and especially Delaware, we're worse than most states. So expungement is key. Um, and it's really time to not only make discretionary expungement, you know, available where, you know, we, we free that up, but we need to make mandatory expungement. We need to have uh, almost a mass amnesty program. Because right now, we have at the Wilmington Port an expansion, about four to 5,000 new jobs that um, you do need to get cleared by the federal government um, in order to get your TWIC card to work on the port. And unfortunately, a lot of hardworking Delawareans won't qualify, won't be able to get that TWIC card because of the records. So it is just a simple change of culture that needs to take place in Delaware. And I can tell you, as an outsider, I'm not familiar with the practice of the, the DOJ, honestly. I've never practiced there. But I've been in a governor's office, and I can tell you the pardon system is an inefficient, and it's, a, it's, a, it's not the right means to clean the records. It's overly cumbersome, too involved, and we really need to expedite and make expungement efficient. And we have to give Delawareans a second chance no matter what background you come from. There were two parts to your question. I think the first part was about the process within the Department of Justice. Um, during my time in management, uh, what that process entailed was when there were bills drafted, there would be a group of attorneys who had different areas of expertise that would make comments and recommendations to the Attorney General. So that, I guess the important piece of that is, you know, your Attorney General, your next Attorney General, their vision is really going to guide where the department falls on issues 
such as liberalizing the expungement statute. And as Attorney General, my position is going to be that the status quo just isn't good enough, and it's time to change how we're doing things in the state of Delaware. If we are actually going to end mass incarceration, then we have to give people a chance to succeed. Um, during my time as a family law practitioner, what we've seen is a, um, a change to the juvenile expungement statute. And a lot of that, what that has entailed is making the process easier. When um, certain cases come up, the court on its own can just go ahead and expunge the record. Um, after certain periods of time, juveniles are elig eligible to get their records expunged. If we're doing it for kids, why are we not doing the same for adults? It's even more important that adults are able to secure housing and to secure sta stable employment so that they're not being funneled back into the Department of Corrections. So my priority actually will be working on expanding expungement options for adults and making the process much easier. Thank you. Real time, time, uh, time sensitive. I, I would. I don't know what 450 included. I'm not familiar with the piece of legislation, but I can tell you I will support legislation that makes expungement easier. And I don't see the necessary reason why pardon should even come into the, the equation. That being said, so I, I would support us looking at some type of vehicle, whether that be 450 or something similar, that would do that. As, as far as um, who makes the policy, it, it's always the attorney general. Um, but, and I think the process is, is, is always pretty much the same. Those, in the, those sections that are affected by it or have expertise in that specific area that the law is, um, they'll make recommendations to the AG. So I, I caution not to kill the messenger because that DAG or that uh, senior um, official is usually just parroting what he's been told to say uh, by the Attorney General. And being a good soldier, he's going to relay his boss's uh, ideas and viewpoints on that issue. But uh, I support uh, making the expungements easier. And, uh, I, I don't know why 450 didn't make it, but um, there should be a vehicle, and I support a vehicle to, to accomplish that. Mr. Maloney, you have yielded some time back, so I'm going to start with you. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, one of the uh, criminal uh, convictions are one of the most heartbreaking uh, of our criminal justice system. What would be your commitment to bring justice to those who were wrongfully convicted in the past, and what will you do to ensure that doesn't happen in the future? say wrongfully convicted, um, that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, the Project Innocence is talking about wrongfully convicted as if there's actual evidence, physical evidence that talks about, um, that shows that that individual was not there, whether it's DNA or some other type of, uh, uh, of hard evidence. Um, it doesn't include recantations of, of testimony um, or uh, or, or where people have changed their mind or, or so forth. So I, I think what we have to do is, when it, it begins at the beginning, when, when you first have those individuals before you, to make sure that the, the evidence is presented um, is, is solid evidence, and that the witnesses that are providing that testimony are, are solid witnesses. That doesn't mean you can't have, uh, a, for the lack of a better word, a jailhouse snitch that would be in there that's not a credible witness, but you have to look at the credibility of an individual. If you have somebody in prison that's, this is the fifth or sixth trial, you gotta look at that person's credibility no matter what he's saying. Um, you have to then look at uh, that aspect of it. So I think it begins um, with training and making sure our deputies aren't looking for that conviction, uh, just for a conviction sake, and make sure they're looking at the credibility of the witnesses um, and whether or not they pass the arsenal test and whether or not we feel comfortable putting these witnesses, uh, you know, before the court uh, in that regard. Tim's already talked about the um, actual innocence program at the Department of Justice, so I won't repeat that, uh, but I think that the, the opportunity that we have moving forward with the next Attorney General and what I would like to do is really focus on, is focusing on giving, changing the law so that the Attorney General has the opportunity to file petitions to amend sentences um, of convicted individuals. Uh, the reality is we're talking about changing a culture of prosecution and really making 
um, you know, the just decisions and the economically sound decisions and not sending people to prison that really don't belong there. But the reality is there's a lot of people in prison that really don't belong there because of the practices of the past. So I think that the next, the next attorney general has an obligation to really step up and make those decisions of the past right those wrongs and uh, really bring those cases before the court and make sure that there are just sentences attached to crimes of the past. I also agree that a change in culture is needed um, to, to overcome the, 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 the scourge of, of the innocent being in prison, um, wrongfully incarcerated. But I kind of break it off into two parts. I see a conviction integrity unit as actually being what needs to exist within the Department of Justice, not an innocence project. I believe an innocence project does better outside of the Department of Justice, such as we have one at John Jay College, and we have others nationally. So Delaware does not have an innocence project. Um, they're actually trying to start one at Delaware Law School, um, and, and they're, they're, they're trying to connect with stakeholders, um, but unfortunately have hit many blocks locally. So if you're innocent in Delaware, you actually have to go to the, the closest innocence project is in Pennsylvania. So it's a big problem in Delaware especially. So we really need to get an outside innocence project, but also we need the Conviction Integrity Unit within a Department of Justice to really work on just that. Make sure if there's been um, cops who have been found to have misconduct or uh, been um, you know, um, liars in the past, that their convictions and convictions connected with those are looked at. That's the path to success. That's paths that New York City has followed, Philadelphia has followed. They have real conviction integrity units, not innocence user units, but integrity units where the um, Department of Justice investigates itself to make sure that those convictions connected with bad cops or unusual circumstances are investigated without a person even having to go to the office to say, hey, I think there's a problem. So that's the path to success, and that's the path to true justice. It is important for the Attorney General to show real leadership in this regard. The door should never be closed to actual innocence under any circumstances, and we must be hyper-vigilant to make sure that as cases find their way through the system, that we are making sure there's sufficient proof and that it's credible proof. Let me give you an example. A case came to my attention when I was state prosecutor in charge of the criminal division under Bo Biden. It was brought to my attention by a defense attorney. It involved a Delaware State University student. She had a stellar, stellar academic record. She had been target shooting with her boyfriend a couple of weeks prior to being called to jury service. And they had taken a small gun and her boyfriend had put it in the bottom of her purse. She forgot about it. She walked into the Kent County Courthouse, all the alarms went off. And she was arrested for a felony carrying a concealed deadly weapon for bringing that gun into the courtroom, courthouse. The prosecutor assigned to the case was going to prosecute that case as a felony. I summoned that prosecutor to my office and I said, why are you doing this to this woman? She had no idea the gun was in there. And he said, because she walked into the courthouse with it. I said, not only can't you prove that case, you shouldn't prove that case. And I said, you're going to drop that charge. And he refused. I signed the paperwork dropping that charge. That's the kind of attorney general you want, making sure that people's rights are protected and that we don't have a conviction in the first place when it's unjust. Thank you very much. It's the last question from panelists, and we'll open up the floor. We have three questions. Um, I think we're closing the session at 8.20, so if we manage time from here onward, we will appreciate that. We'll give you opportunity for closing statements for two minutes each. So it's entirely up to you. Are you going to manage four more questions? We just managed thus far only six or eight, perhaps. Um, as a practicing attorney, I do appreciate, and I'm pretty sure you all do appreciate, as a uh, candidate for Delaware Chief Law Enforcement Office, 
Te orukanti is Babu's state of its discriminatory laws. The laws were passed, enforced, corrected on the same wavelength in, in Delaware uh, legislature. Uh, legislatures have proposed laws which are discriminatory um, and they're targeting uh, religious minorities. Uh, I don't need to go into the section of law, you're well aware of it. I do understand, and we all do understand and appreciate that you're not going to legislate the law. We can acknowledge that. But you have wide discretion in what to enforce and how to enforce the law. With that in mind, what would be your office policy and mechanism in place to enforce or not to enforce law that infringe upon religious minorities' daily practice? Let it be the canonical law for Catholics, the Hadith law for Jews, or Sharia law for Muslims, or other similar religious practice. What mechanism you will put in a place that pre enforcement that you will not regret later on and not have embarrassment for AG office, perhaps the Delawarean that we enforce the law later on will regret that that was discriminatory in, from the get go. What mechanism or policy you will put in a place to filter all those discriminatory laws in practice? I'll start with Mr. Robert with you. I think what is important is that first and foremost, the AG be focused on really identifying that, those laws, and that process has already started with the criminal code rewrite. Uh, we know that one of the purposes, though there are many, is to really identify discriminatory laws that exist in our Delaware code and get rid of them. Um, now, with the current code rewrite, the Department of Justice just has not been a participant in that process. As Attorney General, I believe that the Department of Justice has an obligation to have a seat at the table and, and be engaged in this process because we have to clean up our criminal code. That's the first step. But I think the other piece, as I've mentioned before, is making sure that prosecutors are appropriately exercising their discretion. And we need to make sure that managers are training their prosecutors to do their jobs well and do them fairly and do and have justice be the ultimate goal of any prosecution in any case and empower deputies to the extent that an outcome would be unjust that it's okay to dismiss the case and that you'll have the support of the attorney general in your decision to do so it's about changing the culture i think um first off if we're going to put commerce on you know one of our waterways or at the canal, we always see environmental impact studies. Uh, because it's important. So they figure they, they need to look at how that law is going to affect or that business or that uh, is going to affect the environment. Well, I think we should be doing the same thing with criminal laws and looking at racial impact studies. And there are there are states that, that are, are that do that as a, as a matter of law. There's stat, statutory uh, requirement that they have to have a racial impact study before them. Um, I would push for a racial impact study for any new uh, or existing laws, and I'd push for us to have a, a legislation that would make that statutory so that we're, we're looking at prior to the implementation about what that racial impact may be. Uh, I think the rewrite of the code is a perfect opportunity for us to also look at the various laws that we have on the books. Um, it's going to be a long and arduous uh, process. We're talking about 250 some pages of, of laws that are changed. We're going from you know having no code because the first section repeals that code, and then you're going into each aspect. So you have to really look at it hard because it's uh, it's it's not something that's going to be done in a week, a month. It's going to take a long process, but because we're doing it, we need to do it right and make sure that we're looking at the, the, the uh, disparate impact that, that some of our laws may have. Thank you. Uh, I, too, am a big supporter of racial impact statements. Uh, I was probably the first candidate to talk about it um, thoroughly um, during this campaign trail. Um, so I am, too, a big believer in that. And New Jersey is the perfect example. The state has implemented racial impact statements effectively. Um, and talking with national experts, you know, they are the model to, to go after in terms of what we need in Delaware. Um, because really, we need to look at the, the, the intended and unintended consequences of legislation. And that's why the laws are very powerful. So internally within the Department of Justice, I believe having um, beefing up the policy and legislative team is important. 
because knowing what is going and knowing how to comment on legislation is important. Right now, honestly, the Department of Justice does not comment on much legislation, even if it affects the criminal justice system. Typically, the stance is neutral, or you know, neutral is always a stance. But as Attorney General, I believe it's, it's incumbent upon the leadership in the office to say whether a law is good or bad, and whether it will un have unintended consequences. One past example is when I was in the governor's office, the law to increase the penalties um, for possession of cartons of tobacco, illegal possession, um, which seems like a minor thing, bumping up the classification, increasing the penalty. But what happened was we didn't have the Department of Justice speak out, and the law actually got passed. So now it's actually, um, you know, it, the, the penalty is more harsh now for um, having cartons of cigarettes. And that can affect a shop owner or an independent um, entrepreneur. And so that has an impact on communities of color. So it's legislation like that that has gotten passed in Delaware time and time again. So I agree uh, with Mr. Melania. We do need um, racial impact studies, and we need them now. I agree that all of these measures are important. Um, paying attention to the code rewrite so that we are aware of and eliminate racially discriminatory and, and religiously discriminatory laws on the books. I believe that racial impact statements can benefit us as well because there are unintended consequences. But perhaps most importantly in my mind um, is that we need to be in communication with groups throughout the state. And I welcome the opportunity, I look forward to the opportunity to meet regularly with the Muslim Society, with groups statewide about what their beliefs are in terms of specific laws. How is this impacting you? And how can we work together to change what's on the books? And how do we work together to prevent laws from ever being on the books that would disproportionately impact anyone? Because it is through that constant communication, outreach, prosecutors, the Department of Justice, the Attorney General needs to get out from behind our desk and to get into our communities and learn and we learn as much from you instead of just telling you what the law should be. Thank you. That concludes the question from panelists. I thank my uh, distinguished panelists. And uh, now I request Dr. Barker to come up, and we will open up for uh, audience. Once again, thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. <clears throat> uh, we have three questions from the audience, uh, and I would like to explain the process that we have used. We had repeatedly asked uh, our audiences on Facebook and on an email list uh, to submit questions. We received several questions. Most of those questions were already included as part of the uh, uh, panel's questions. However, we have three very important questions. And uh, I would like uh, Mashur Oduwale to come here first. And as he's coming, I would like to remind you um, I think all the candidates have their sign-up sheets. Please feel free to uh, sign those up. Uh, give them your email address so they can stay uh, in touch with you, and you can be updated with what's going on in their campaign. Sure. Um, in May of this year, the News Journal uh, ran a story about one Mr. Kenny Cooper, a speech for the six, uh, who spent nearly two years in jail without a trial because he could not afford to put up the $200 bill. Um, the Newcastle County Court Commissioner, Mr. Bradley Manning, who eventually dismissed what he called a relatively minor charges after two years, called the, the Delaware Department of Justice delay in prosecuting the defendant, a quote, frankly, perplexing, end of quote. Last year, the state of New Jersey virtually uh, eliminated cash bail. And instead, the state began to evaluate criminal defendants based on the risk they pose to the public. And also, in the last few days, um, Senator Bernie Sanders of Maine introduced the No Bill Act legislation in Congress. 
which among other things will prohibit money bail in federal criminal cases. Uh, my question to you, uh, um, candidate, is if you were elected, uh, what do you do as the AG to make sure that people do not languish in jail who are awaiting trials for minor offenses because they just couldn't afford to, uh, because they're just too poor to, um, um, to post bail? And my question is, would you, as the state attorney general, support and advocate for ending cash bail in Delaware and such as has been done in states like New Jersey and New What's up with you? The answer is yes. And it's an excellent question. Thank you. Cash bail, our money-based bail system, imprisons people because they are poor, not because they are guilty. We should not have people sitting in jail because they are too poor to afford bail. 65% of the people in prison pending trial are there on $1,000 money bail or less. That means that they can't come up with $100 to pay a bail bonds person. The system is wrong, and I have worked to change it. We need to eliminate it. Bail should be based upon two things, risk and appearance at trial. And if someone is not a risk of harming other human beings, and there are ways to get them to trial, they shouldn't be sitting in jail. What we need to do is eliminate cash bail. There is legislation that has been passed this year that takes a first step in that direction. I applaud it, I supported it, but more needs to be done. And as Attorney General, I would fight to end our cash bail system because it is wrong, it's discriminatory, and it doesn't work. And so it, it will take legislation to make this happen but it also is going to take education so that people understand that we cannot imprison people for poverty. And right now, we are. I will fight to end that. Sure. I'm glad, at least on the cash bail issue, there's a lot of, like, a lot of agreement on that issue. I think we all see the system. We're all going to articulate in different ways on how to address it. But um, again, I've addressed the problem, not even as an attorney, but as an activist, working with the community um, and trying to get bail reform. It should have passed last year, but it finally passed the first lake this year. So I don't come to perspective as my nine to five, but I've been working with the coalitions in the community, faith community, and getting this done and working towards it. And as attorney general, it will be a priority. Because right now, besides the human, the ethical responsibility, I look at the fiscal impact of what the, the, the system is doing. We are wasting money. So uh, the, the young gentleman you spoke about, it costs over $45,000 a year to house him. Imagine the books we can provide, the treatment we can provide, the community center's funding, if we had a little bit of that $45,000. So we have an ethical and a fiscal responsibility to address this. And day one, that's gonna be a priority besides retraining, it's gonna be addressing the debtor's prisons in the system has oppressed low income and minority communities for way too long, and I'm tired of it. Thank you for that question, and the factual circumstances that you explained are the perfect example of what we're talking about here. People being detained simply because they don't have the money to post bail, and especially when they're presumed innocent, right? So here's the thing. The next attorney general doesn't have to wait for the legislative process. The reality is we can see a lot of pro progress in this area just with the attorney general issu issuing policies about requesting bail. So, you know, this is, this is simple. As attorney general, I fully intend to issue policies to direct prosecutors not to seek cash bail when it's, not, when it's, when it's unnecessary. Um, and especially when we're talking about $200, it was unnecessary to begin with. Um, ideally, what I would like to see is Delaware move towards a, um, a program similar to what we're seeing in Washington, D.C., 
Um, they have basically um, the equivalent of probation so that they were able to do away with cash bail and what they've seen is quite a bit of success. So when you're monitoring people who are out on bail in the community, they're appearing for court, um, they're not committing new offenses, they're complying with the terms of their bail conditions. That's all we need, but they don't need to be detained in corrections to do that because it's just fiscally irresponsible. The new attorney general is going to come in to office and there's going to be a cash bail system. And you have to understand the cash bail system because a lot of the abuses that are being talked about are, are people being put in jail for minor offenses. More often than not, the law enforcement officer arrests somebody, takes them before the justice, justice of the peace court, and the JP court judge is the one that sets the bail. The AG's office isn't involved in at that point. The new AG has to turn around and get up with the court and have a, a frank discussion so that at that point, at that juncture, that individual is, is not being uh, penalized because of his socioeconomic status. But it has to be done early on because one day is too, day, is too long to be in jail when you shouldn't be in jail. So we have to then go to the JP court system, which is where it's first occurring. And they have their own little guidelines about what they set bail at. And we need to we need to revisit that and we need to put pressure on the courts so that we can turn around and say, okay, you shouldn't be setting cash bail for these type of offenses. Just put them out on their own, uh, unsecured bond and just move on because that's where the problem is initially. <laughs> now, when it gets to us at a later date, whether it's arraignment or when the AG's office is involved, that's when we can get in there and step in and say, look, there shouldn't be a, a cash bail for this and, and move forward. But it needs to start initially at the JP court level and we have to make sure that we're, we're doing all we can to get that done. May I request Dr. Salim Khan for the next question? Uh, Because you all made such a convincing case of your tendency. I'll keep thinking and try to find more facts about you and your struggles. Having said that, thinking about this particular moment, this kind of gathering, it came to my mind what some years back Paul John Pop, uh, the Pope John Paul II said. He said, the greatness of a nation should be judged how it treats its most disadvantaged people. And being a mental health professional, I deal with those people who have sort of double bang. They have mental psychiatric issues and they also have legal issues. And anyone can imagine that how disadvantaged they are and how both systems push them towards the other. And they got caught in the middle and there are a lot of things that need to be done from the first point to the last and that particular group really, really need our attention and help. And I would appreciate all the comments from all four of you as to what you could do when you are in that position. Thank you very much. So mentally, uh, mental health issue and law enforcement issue. Uh, again, I'll go to Mr. Johnson. I want to make sure everybody gets a question. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I'm sorry for the confusion, but we will try to, I will try to make it clear <laughs> who, who, who the best choice is, but, um, but, but this is a, this is a, this is a, you have to look at history, you know, when they started closing down mental health institutions in the 1960s, in the 1970s, that's when we started using jails as warehouses for those who suffered from maladies. So, um, unfortunately, the system, um, kept feeding the jails. That's why the, the prison population has exploded. America is the prison capital of the world. And Delaware is one of the worst in the prison capital world. So we must just take a human element where 
Um, our law enforcement officers, both for trained and experienced in knowing how to identify mental health issues and work on the ground with the community to solving the issues because the worst place for someone suffering from maladies is in fact incarceration. So I am committed as Attorney General um, on not only um, you know, proper treatment of justice system, but making sure they get the health care that they need. And my plan for ending mass incarceration works that way. Because if I reduce the prison population by five to 10% each year, guess what? We're gonna have more resources for mental health treatment, for substance abuse treatment, for the exact things that you're committed to and I'm committed to. Thank you. Thank you. You are, um, your question is excellent. Too many people are in prison because they are mentally ill. And there, there are two issues that I see the Attorney General working on to change this. And the first is that we need to make sure that when someone suffers from a mental health crisis, that it doesn't boil over into uh, a criminal act. And that involves first responders. I'm very proud to say that I've worked with the Newcastle County Police as Chief Administrative Officer to obtain a grant that enables a mental health crisis counselor to ride with the police so that when there is a crisis, that there is someone trained to de-escalate that crisis. As Attorney General, I would advocate for de-escalation training statewide among our police officers so that they were equipped with diffusing a situation before it ended up being a crime. The second thing is, if someone is mentally ill and caught up in the criminal justice system, we need more and better treatment for that person. We need to increase the number of people who are diverted away from a conviction and into treatment. There is a mental health court that is run by Chief Judge Jordan and others in Delaware, and it works. But we need more of it because so many more people just need help. They don't need to be sent to prison. So we need to increase the amount of mental health treatment that is available for people to avoid a criminal situation to begin with. And if there is a crime committed, to be diverted away from a conviction for that crime because it is wrong to incarcerate someone because they are mentally ill. Let me address it from two aspects. The first aspect is those individuals that may be on the street because of, um, amongst other things, mental, mental health issues. Um, a lot of times when the law enforcement are picking these indiv individuals up because of whether it be bizarre behavior or minor disorderly behavior, they, they take them to um, a hospital or a facility hoping to get them committed. Um, unfortunately, the way that process is, I, I'm not so sure it works because that individual, if he gets committed at that particular time, and sometimes the, uh, the ER doctors are telling him, hey, you know, if you sign yourself in, within 24 hours, you can sign yourself out. Whereas if you're committed, you're committed for a longer period of time. Ergo, they usually <laughs> voluntarily commit themselves. And, and they're sent to a, whether it's Dover Behavioral or what other facilities that are around, which are too far uh, and uh, too little, they then turn around and let themselves out. You haven't solved that problem. You haven't, because you, you can't be within, and this is just my personal view, I'm not a, a, a you know mental health professional. I don't think you can solve that problem in that short period of time. The other aspect is the, the criminal behavior. When, when you realize that the criminal behavior sometimes is, is not caused by an intent to do criminal behavior, but because of the, the mental health issue that's there, that if they were either on their medications or some other factors are there, they're in treatment, they wouldn't be doing that type of behavior. We've gotta be able to, to fashion that out, and I think that's what the mental health court does. But I think what it comes down to is the lack of treatment facilities or the a lack of personnel to be able to do it. Um, I've, I've spoken to, in Sussex County to a couple mental health professionals, and they were talking about the fact that 
um, there's just not enough of them to, to really do the job that they need to do. And we need to start trying to look at it from a state uh, treatment standpoint rather than a punitive standpoint. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. <clears throat> I talked a bit about um, the importance of changing the culture of prosecution and making sure that prosecutors understand that when they're pursuing a case, the ultimate goal is best outcomes for everyone involved. And I think that it's important that prosecutors are trained to be particularly sensitive to issues related to mental health and substance abuse issues. Um, the reality is um, sending individuals who are struggling with those sorts of issues to the Department of Corrections isn't helpful because they're not receiving the support and the services that they need. So we need to make sure that prosecutors are trained to funnel individuals to um, mental health courts in the case that they are struggling with issues related to mental health court. I've seen this be particularly efficient with regard to youth and the family court's mental health court. And it also helps in that <clears throat> they're able to avoid a, an adjudication of delinquency or a conviction in the uh, case of a, an adult um, so that they're able to maintain stability in the community, have the support of their friends and family, maintain employment if, if that is the case, and actually get the mental health tra treatment that they need. And that's the process that I would be supportive of as attorney general. Thank you. Uh, our last, last question comes from one of the youth from our community. Morgan, uh, please come here. Uh, while she comes in, um, we will give you a couple of minutes uh, for uh, closing arguments. Uh, and your arguments, you know, so far we have seen that all of you agree with each other a lot. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but it makes it difficult uh, for people to judge because all of you, all of audience is looking at you that you are all good people. What makes you stand out? So focus on that in your closing arguments. Um, a few weeks ago, Muslim children, women, and were removed from the pool for wearing clothing that covered their bodies on the ground that some of the clothing might have contained cotton. The pool manager removed the children, saying no cotton pool policy, which turned out to be false because of the city of Bloomington does not have any official or written policy about specific type of clothing. Even if there was such a policy, how could a pool manager always ensure that the amount of cotton in the fabric can be measured? These children were asked to leave at multiple occasions, and at one of the occasions, a uniformed police officer also asked them about when they will be leaving. These actions are, were defended by the city's lower and middle level management for several weeks until it all went viral and became international news, and all thanks to Mr. Deborah Cole's report. At that point, Wilmington's mayor issued an apology. This incident is only a glimpse of, into what members of American minorities, including Muslim communities, face on a regular basis, and discrimination can take several forms. My question to you is, what will you do to the policies and actions that are discriminatory, or have the appearance of being discriminatory, without having the need for higher level officials to intervene? I think it, it, as long as, as we're looking at the Department of Justice and say we're looking at our policies and procedures, um, I think what needs to happen is we have to look at them and make sure that we're doing things in a fair and just manner. And the fact that we're not doing something that has inadvertently um, caused some type of discrimination. Um, you know, I, I think that it's that it's incumbent for any attorney general, whether it's um, in regards to racial discrimination or any other type of discrimination, to make sure that their Department of Justice sets the tone that we're doing everything we can in a fair and just manner, that we're treating everyone as we wish to be treated ourselves. That's the bottom line. The fact that when you look out upon the people and the citizens of, of, of Delaware, that you're treating them as you treat your own children, or your own family member, and, and that's what's important, and that's what you have to make sure that if you find policies that don't do that, if you find policies that would uh, make you cringe if they were done against your child or your relative, 
then that's wrong and you should move to fix it. The Attorney General and his Chief Law Enforcement Officer um, of the state of Delaware has an obligation to ensure that the system is fair and just. Sadly, over the years, it's not what we've seen. So with the new Attorney General coming into the office, this is our opportunity to set the tone. And I think once the new AG sets the tone and says that they're, they're supportive of fairness and justice, and they feel a sense of obligation to serve the community and do it fairly and justly, then the rest of the community will follow suit. And that includes identifying policies that are discriminatory and changing policies, changing laws, creating new laws to the extent that it's necessary and creating new policies to ensure fairness and justice. That's what I intend to do as Attorney General. Mr. <clears throat> Thank you very much to the youth who are engaged and very, uh, they're paying attention and they, they haven't nodded out yet. So uh, thank you very much for, for, for participating because they are the future and a lot of policies to talk about them today, tonight will actually impact them the most. So um, it's very important that we keep our youth engaged. Um, and just go back to uh, defending Delawareans against discrimination. It does come down to trust. We must build trust with the community. Now I want to do something out there, but how many of you have actually met the attorney general? Raise your hands. Not too many people. And that's, that's just uncalled for. And so under my leadership, not only will you know the attorney general, but you will know those who are under him. Because my job is to not be in the Carvel office building, to be out in the community, coming to the machine, going to the playground, playing basketball or soccer, or whatever I need to do to build the trust with the community. And that's really where it starts, because we all will, will, will fight against the policy, but it's really building the trust with the community so that I know what's going on. I know the practices of the pool um, prior to an incident even having to be report, reported by Christina Dedra. So that's the, what my office would do. So community engagement is the key. And that's actually how you fight discrimination, from just being there with the community. Silence fosters discrimination. The Attorney General must be the spokesperson to ensure that discriminatory policies do not take place, the practices do not take place at all. And how do we do that? We do that by being on the front line to protect people against discrimination. And when we see discrimination, we must say something, and we must say it publicly when we see wrongs being done. Because silence just enables it to grow. Regular meetings with people of all beliefs, of all races, all backgrounds, with the Attorney General is also important so that we are hearing from you what is going on. What is happening that makes your children worried and that worries you for the future of your children? I hear all the time that people are bullied in school. That is wrong. And it is up to the Attorney General to stand up and fight against that and to protect our children in school from being discriminated against and bullied. As the Attorney General, that would be a top priority of my office, to make sure that discriminatory practices and policies cannot coexist with the way we want to live in the state of Delaware. Mm -hmm. Last round, try to convince the folks who put on the fence line. <laughs> In the audience, uh, I would tell you that there are a lot of people who have uh, very emotional situations with a number of issues, but if I were to narrow those down, they are, uh, uh, they are about show of extreme strength from law enforcement, then they knock down doors, uh, the other uh, important emotional issue that I've uh, received relates to pardons, expungements that you have already talked about. Uh, so in your closing statements, the two minutes each that you have, please focus on big ideas. 
how will you distinctly uh, run the office in a way that makes Delaware safe, at the same time uh, does not pit citizens versus law enforcement and brings people together? I think we started with uh, yeah. you from the beginning. So let's end, uh, end with you then. Uh, Mr. Malloy, go first, please. Mr. Lasha, two minutes. <laughs> We've talked about a lot of issues tonight, and very serious issues. And we need change, but change doesn't occur overnight. And no attorney general is going to facilitate that change by himself. We need to communicate with our partners in the criminal justice arena, as well as our citizens and our business community across the board, and, and work together to effectuate change. Now that being said, you have to change within before you start changing without. And I think that that's the most important part, that when the Attorney General comes in office, that he looks within the department about ways that he can fix the problems that he that he feels exist, and through training and, and other aspects. But let me, and I'm gonna point out, there are some differences between the, between the candidates, um, and, and I'll be more than happy to, to say that. Uh, I support the death penalty in limited situations, and, and where I'm talking about premeditated murder of, law, of a first responder or a correctional officer in a correctional facility during the commission of, of his duties, as well as uh, acts of terrorism. I think that they, those attacks are on the very fabric of our, our, our well-being and our government, and that's why I support that. The other is I don't support the legalization of marijuana. I've, I travel the country a lot and I talk to law enforcement agencies, and there are problems with the legalization that aren't being transmitted because it's such a cash cow for some states. Um, so those are two areas that there is a difference, I think, with me and uh, my fellow candidates. The bottom line is I promise to communicate with the public and with your input of how I'm doing, how we're not doing, but also at the beginning of where are we going wrong and make sure that within the Department of Justice we're correcting those issues and those problems. Mr. There are not a lot of substantive differences among us except the ones that Mr. Bellini just mentioned. After all, we are all Democrats <laughs> and we are all uh, good people and, and we're looking for justice in the broadest sense of that word. What I believe separates me uh, and why I am asking for your strong support to be the next Attorney General. I've never run for office before. I don't seek any other office. This is the office I want to run because this is the time when we can make real change in the criminal justice system, where we can build trust in law enforcement and our communities. And how do you know I can make the changes to criminal justice that we've talked about? How do you know that I can bring about safer, fairer communities in Delaware? Because that's what I've been doing. When I see injustice, I change it. But my name has never been on the door, and only the Attorney General can lead the force for the change we need now. We need to change our laws, we need to change the practices of law enforcement. Knocking down doors, lock them up and throw away the key is gone. That is gone. And it needs to never come back. We need a strong attorney general who has a proven track record of leading important criminal justice changes and of protecting our victims, protecting the rights of people, protecting their civil rights, their constitutional rights. I have spent my entire career in the cause of justice as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney, and as a public advocate. I hope I can count on your support on September 6th. Please vote in the primary. Thank you. Yes, we're done. 
thank you very much for inviting us tonight. And, and, and in closing, I'm just going to say uh, the number is 2251, um, which is a campaign that I've started um, and is, 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 I believe, what sets me apart. Um, 22 is the number percentage of African Americans in Delaware. 51% is the, uh, the, the percentage of the prison population that African Americans um, consist of. And so it's a system that exists in Delaware for way too long. And I respect everyone at this table, but they have been complicit in building this system for decades. And I, you know, I know, you know they're all good people. They have a lot of experience. We all have a lot of experience. But silence was complicity in building this system. And so it really takes someone from the outside with no allegiances to the current um, stakeholders who will dismantle the system and really work to change what we have. And I know there, there's reasons their stuff wasn't done. The citizens who are incarcerated don't care. They are desperate. And so we need change. And I am that change because I know, and I have been involved in politics, and so I know how to move the needle with the governor, with city council, with whoever needs to be moved to get justice for our people. And I have been speaking out about racial injustice from day one. And I submit to you, look at January when the candidates did press releases. I was the only one talking about racial injustice and mass incarceration. And it's been a central focus of my campaign from day one. And I believe as campaigns go, stories and ideas change when they saw that mass incarceration was the hearts and minds of everyone in Delaware. So that's why I believe I'm the best choice, because you have to trust that the person you elect will do what they say they're going to do. And I've been working on justice reform for a long time, before even running on the campaign trail, I've been working with community members. And that's the best experience as a community organizer that I bring to the table, that I have not only the experience in governance, but the, the experience as a community organizer. And that's why I ask for your support on September 6th. Thank you. I left my job in January of this year to run uh, for attorney general. And to tell you the truth, my circumstances wouldn't necessarily be considered ideal. I was about six months pregnant when I left my job. And to tell you the truth, I was really nervous um, because I had really, I had worked hard at the Department of Justice to work my way up the ranks. And I had to dig deep and decide, do I have something to offer to our community that's worth me taking this huge risk. It was a risk for myself, professionally, it was a risk for my family. But when I thought about my son who I was carrying, and I thought about my seven-year-old daughter, I felt a sense of urgency about leaving. The reality is, it doesn't matter whether you're a first-time political candidate, we're all first-time political candidates. The question becomes, do you have the political will to change how things have been done in Delaware for years? The criminal justice system is broken. It's been broken for decades. Any progress that's claimed at this point has been minimal. It hasn't happened fast enough. Right now, we're having all the right conversations about reforming our criminal justice system, our prison system, about protecting Delawareans from the Trump administration, these are real issues. We don't have another 30 years to fix it. We don't. I'm asking you for your vote. I'm asking you for your support because I am in this to change the state of Delaware for everyone. I'm not beholden to anyone. I'm not attached to old practices. What I come to you is with a good balance of experience and passion about people. When I left my job, I didn't even have my platform done. You know why? Because I needed to get in the community and talk to people and understand what their concerns were. And I took my time and I listened and I crafted a platform that I'm really proud of because it's about the people of the state of Delaware. It's not about me. It's about helping, well, it's about me a little bit. It's about helping me and my kids, but it's about you and your kids too. As a community, we have to be strong and we have to work together. So I'm asking for your vote on September 6th because we have to be together as a community to change our criminal justice system for the better. Thank you.
Thank you very much once again. Uh, before I ask uh, the Mashur to come for the closing remarks, uh, I would like to remind you that your, the audience, job starts now. We need your feedback. We need to know, uh, after listening to this debate, which candidates you are inclined to support more than the others, and why. And this is how we want this feedback. We want you to send us a text message. Text message can be sent to that number right there on that banner at the bottom, 302-533-8004. Uh, let us know which candidates you are inclined to support more and why. Uh, and we will uh, stay tuned. We will have a few more debates coming in uh, for other bases uh, across the state and uh, uh, local in our jurisdiction. Uh, so please stay in touch with the show. Again, good evening. And uh, I couldn't help myself while I'm sitting there watching and and listening to all, all four of you to think about something really important. As an immigrant, I really value the process of choosing our, our, our political leaders in general. I want to remind everyone in the audience, whether you are an immigrant or were born here, this is an opportunity that don't let it pass you by like it is, don't take it lightly. This is, so many people have died across the whole world have an opportunity to ask a question to a candidate, or maybe sit there and choose one freely. So having said that, I wanted to thank every one of you guys. Thank you for your commitment to serve us as citizens, and thank you for coming here to speaking to us and taking the time to answer all of our questions. For that, I appreciate it on behalf of all the Muslim community in Delaware. Thank you for reaching out. Thank you for working hard to provide the justice that we desperately need. Thanks again. We'd like to invite you for the food. Thank you for David and his team to provide the venue for us to have this uh, great debate. You all are great people. You are truly make it hard for us to choose. Thank you.